Hey, good morning. Like uh, was said, I'm Sebastian by Cados, a relief organization that uh, was founded in Berlin about one and a half years ago from a subcultural context. Uh, partly with a lot of experience in field work, uh, some of us have been doing this for 15 years. Uh, we found each other because we didn't like the way things go with many organizations, which is also why we gave us ourselves this rather bold title, Redefining Global Solidarity. Uh, which, uh, what's a bit unusual is uh, that I can talk uh, f at this venue because IT is about as distant from me as I can imagine. I like just to switch the computer on and, and be happy if nothing bad happens. Um, but I can actually uh, give a good overview about the current situation uh, and the problems that we are dealing with in the field, as they say. I will try to see, uh, sketch solutions as well, but be patient. Um, all the technical terms I found from Wikipedia are in my slides. I think I can fairly easily s I can sketch our problems, but deeper questions will be difficult. I'm, I'd be grateful for suggestions and, and ideas. So let's just briefly uh, outline what we do, uh, what uh, disasters are about, uh, where we are, uh, where we are currently working, and what the problems are that we are facing right now. Um, one of the areas is North Syria, also known as um, the, the Kurdish area, uh, the liberated area. Um, um, hardly anyone works there, uh, perhaps five organizations can be found. And uh, at the moment, what we do are uh, education projects for paramedics and uh, helpers, surgery, uh, medical uh, uh, provision is, is our focus because it's important to, to give the skills back to this new society. And uh, we are working with the relief organization, uh, the, the Kurdish uh, Crescent. And um, the other project came from uh, the fact that civil war areas like this, the combatants uh, do target uh, civil infrastructure. This, these are pictures from, from the hospital in Cobain, which you will know from the, from the news, uh, which was completely captured by Islamic State but then liberated itself again. Uh, this is an example of an hospital from Médecins Sans Frontières, um, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, and this is a medical station which just ju just last week was flattened. Uh, we had been doing education here. Our response was just, this was a very uh, dangerous area, so to build stationary units there would be difficult, so we are thinking about establishing a mobile hospital. And in Berlin, we are just now rebuilding the first lorry for that. Uh, for another one, we are somewhat lacking in funds, but we're working on it. So in Iraq and North Syria, uh, North Syria, uh, we would like a completely mobile unit uh, for security reasons, security of, of us and our teams. Uh, we are also engaging in technical relief. Um, uh, for example, here, uh, f um, fire brigades, uh, firefighting equipment, not just Rojava, because it has to be said, it's, it's not. this is not the region that's worst hit. Aleppo, for example, looks much worse at the moment. And our last big area is uh, Lesbos in the Greek island, uh, where we have a boat and uh, it turns out we, we got in touch with the community on the island itself. You know that there is a huge problem here. You have all these life vests lying around, thousands of them, uh, and we are trying to finance a sea rescue in that area. So that's where we are. And these are our problems. These slides are in English. Uh, the translators, thank you for that. The translators, um, first example, Haiti. Uh, the earthquake in 2010, there was a massive earthquake there with several aftershocks. And uh, in, for that earthquake, uh, the, the focus was in Port-au-Prince, the capital, and at, uh, almost uh, at least 300,000 people died and many people became homeless and there was an, uh, there was an unprecedented wave of help 
you know, it has to be known that infrastructure was completely destroyed. Uh, hospitals, uh, uh, radio communications, uh, anything you can imagine, it was all destroyed. And in very short time, countless relief organizations were there. The big problem, uh, the big advantage for Haiti was that uh, the U.S. is very close, and the U.S. does seem to watch how they can establish themselves politically in the area. So they, they sent lots of, of divisions and uh, uh, technical equipment with which they could quite quickly set up basic telephone communications. So on Haiti, the problem was not, was not to be able to, to make telephone calls, but the, the question was, with whom can I make telephone calls? Who is actually there? And um, due to uh, the fact that the phone network was completely destroyed, all knowledge that had been there, there before was completely gone. How do, can I reach ministries, state institutions, what, the, what are the numbers? Uh, these had been switched off long term. Of course, the US phone network was completely new on top. And uh, what that prevented at first was that helpers uh, could be supplied, uh, could be brought together with the necessary goods. And what I remember was that I spent two, three days just wandering around aimlessly, uh, finding where the large pharmacies are, where the relief supplies arrived, um, and where the material could be picked up. Just that knowledge, uh, it wasn't available by internet. Uh, there only was an emergency telephone network, of course. And the next problem then was uh, how can I coordinate with uh, uh, and, and find the places uh, and, and the people there that I want to get to. Uh, uh, lots of uh, just spontaneously grown refugee camps, people finding their space where they can feel safe from aftershocks, where they think that nothing will happen. How can I make sure that they're supplied and how can information be relayed? And how can I make sure that that's, that circuit uh, in some way can, can match. And that did not happen at all in Haiti. Uh, from, in a military, from a, from, a, from a monetary point of view, it was, a, it was a grave for millions of dollars. The relief measures and, and, and those uh, affected simply could not be brought together. And to just summarize, more than 900 relief organizations were there in, in a very short amount of time. After three weeks, it was completely <laughs> chaotic from small from, from large organization to so-called mongos my own ngo a very popular thing in the us christian motivated or people that think they need to do something and, and set up their relief organization a couple of people packing med medicine and and, and traveling and, and thinking they can help you can imagine what what a chaotic uh, a number of organizations you then have who then try to use, try to get get together somehow. In week three, I think it was twelve thousand helpers on on location, not counting U.S. soldiers, and uh, a lot of different working fields. Uh, uh, not just Mets in building stability, which buildings are prone to collapse, uh, corpse uh, recovery, uh, food. So, and even within medicine, there are very different areas to consider, long time um, care, uh, prevention, uh, vaccination, it's completely chaotic. And the only, all that you know, uh, is all the help you can get is from the UN Office for Humanitarian Affairs called cluster um, meetings. And, and they take that seriously. Um, um, 900 organizations and there's one tent where they put up plans and where 900 organizations are supposed to meet and, and arrange how uh, they can coordinate their activities and, and of course that won't work which means that there are several subclusters developing uh, technical clusters medical clusters and some of them divided by nationality the German organizations perhaps go to the German embassy and say this is where the Germans will meet no one knows why because uh, nationality is not a sensible way of dividing things, but that's how things are. That's how they were in 2010 and how things still are in new disaster areas. Uh, this is uh, for the natural disaster example with uh, wide range destruction. Similar things 
uh, in Syria, Rojava, where we were. I, if you look at this, if you look at this map, some of you may know it. This is uh, how how things are, and uh, if you if you follow this in the area, these, the black area looks huge, the IS controlled area, but it's smaller if you reduce it to the black dots, which are the settlements. The, the huge parts are just unsettled areas, which is quite easy to capture, of course. Uh, the red part is what the Assad government are currently occupying, and the green uh, areas are a melange of Syrian rebels. Um, uh, the Free Syrian Army is known in the, in the media, but there are many Islamistic, not quite IS level, but Islam, Islamistic areas. So you don't know which street is controlled by whom. And the yellow areas, meanwhile, uh, from mid-December, are what the democrat democratic forces in the Kurdish forces have liberated. Uh, you like to think of the evil Kurds, the PKK, uh, if you think of Kurds, but there are many more players. There is a large Syrian community, there is uh, an, an Arab, Arab units, um, and, and they are all under one roof organization and were able to liberate this, this area. Now, you have to think of it in this way. In these areas, there is no state con government, no state institutions. And, and fighting has taken place in all these areas. So uh, crazy, what's crazy is that refugees from North Iraq vol voluntarily go to Syria because they don't trust the Peshmerga anymore. So this part of Syria, which has partly been, been destroyed by bombing, it contains much more, many more people from from, na from the neighboring country, which have been, which live in refugee camps per se, don't bring any communication structures apart from their mobile phones. And in the cities, um, which look this way, uh, this is Cobain, uh, Kobani, and uh, thousands of people living in the ruins. This is These are not selected photos, this is what it looks like all around. And of course, in here, there is no existing communication structure either. So how do people do it? Internet and telephone only works uh, through the, net, uh, the network that seeps in from Turkey. So those with money can count themselves lucky. They can count. No, they can buy uh, SIM cards from Turkso, and those that don't are just on uh, kept dry. They have nothing. So again, no state structures, no state that in any way would try to to get things right. Assad has no interest to re-establish communications in this area. No UN, interestingly, you no know United Nations, which normally is the case with large disaster because the UN uh, is not uh, it, it's not the case for the UN because this is a civil war and the Assad government does not give permission. Now, Turkey, of course, is able to switch off networks at will, which does happen. You know that there are extreme clashes in the north, in the Turkish Kurdish areas, uh, and that means that regularly internet and telephone services are switched off by Turkey, which then, of course, affects the whole area in Syria, uh, which no previously was able to use this network. So the whole communication, logistics, infrastructure, where are medical supplies, medical stations, etc., etc., is broken down to paper and pen, the good old letter communication. And... Uh, which means that there are handwritten lists of phone numbers. Uh, uh, you used to have internet-based donation lists, but uh, now we have handwritten ones in the hospitals that they go through, and it goes from one mobile to the other as long as the Turkcell network works. So by hand, people are trying to call donate donors to uh, find for specific supplies. Completely crazy for 2015. Very hard to imagine. Third example, mass protests. I don't have to say much. The examples are manifold. Uh, Arab Spring, uh, Ch um, China, Thailand, everywhere where's the, where government populations are trying to rise and where are processes of negotiation f within more or less democratic protest movements. So uh, if the protest movement, uh, if, if telecommunications and internet are in the hands of the state, they can be simply switched off. <clears throat> what solutions are there? And now this is the part uh, where you can just review my incompetence. FireChat is one of the first pro providers in mesh networking. 
that uh, work peer-to-peer. -peer. If the networks aren't there, they do say uh, they have little experience. Uh, um, the, uh, the problem with fire chat now is it's all unencrypted. And for mass protest movements, this is not convenient. They do want. They say they do want to offer an encrypted service. Uh, the problem is, it's just it's just a messaging service. So in terms of organization, you haven't gained anything. Uh, in areas where the network is switched off, you could start communicating via mesh, mesh networks, but uh, the organizational situation doesn't improve by that. Then, different approaches of which I want to introduce two. Um, to use this mesh networking uh, through either an extender or uh, even more complicated hardware. One of the, the first one is an Australian project, Servo, um, which in 2013 had a crowdfunding to fund uh, the uh, radio extenders for the networks. Unfortunately, that uh, crowdfunding was not successful. Their idea was that conventional radio communications could be used with those extenders to uh, uh, supply communications in disaster areas. Problem is the same again, but uh, I have communications, but I haven't increased the level of organization. A similar project in Berlin, so-called Ingenium project uh, at the Technical University, uh, that went a bit further um, because they developed an app with the hardware um, which is supposed to uh, uh, be used to report problems. I would like to quote their own words from the website. Uh, a website and app was developed uh, with, which uh, should uh, enable the typical concerned state institutions, relief organizations to, to uh, start relief efforts quickly. Uh, it, it's possible to say which streets are intact, where help is needed, and what help has already been given. And this is collected and, and given to the uh, uh, relevant organizations and put into a map so that extra double efforts can be avoided. Uh, the system is sketched, uh, designed in a way that it can stay in the air for up, and up to a week. They talk about being in the air because the extenders can be um, uh, put into the disaster areas via uh, aerial vehicles. Uh, but uh, from a practical point of view in field work, there are several issues that make this a difficult thing. First, this only works in disaster areas that have led to a lot of, of international interest because it takes equipment which is fairly expensive. Both of these projects, the, the aerial vehicles, the blimps, have to be financed somehow. So we need a catastrophe that has uh, led to a lot of media attention, or the UN has to be ready to, to supply the funds. In With disasters, that is not always the case. In Syria, that has it has been the case for three years that the evil Kurds, uh, as they say, in the north were not supplied for, for three years. And you don't even have to go to civil war areas to see problems. Look at the Philippines in 2013 after the typhoon Jolanda. Um, the main area that was hit was, was an island which uh, was uh, not popular with central government because there was a different organization in, in, in control there. So for us as a relief organization working uh, in the field, there was a huge restriction through the fact that state help that should have been and could have been supplied simply wasn't there. So if the UN again wants to uh, get active, they need permission by the state concerned. And if, if the state does not cooperate, uh, the local population has lost. So the other difficult area is particularly in civil war areas such as Syria, uh, a, a, an area vehicle of uh, non-moving is, of course, the first uh, point of attack uh, where sabotage can, can uh, target. And that would probably happen here as well uh, for this kind of equipment. So in Turkey, IS, Syria, uh, the army, Syrian army, it would not be a problem to, to simply deactivate this very quickly. Um, right. Um, there is a, a further method which is collecting data via crowd mapping. 
Uh, there's an app called Ushahidi, which uh, two, three, four years ago started, I think. Uh, this is a screenshot from 2000. I did find, find screenshots from 2010. Huge, fantastic idea, of course. The community uh, on site can collect this. I want to say about the, these other projects, when they say that data is being collected, analyzed, and, and forwarded to the relevant organizations, you always have to ask who does this. And uh, if you rely on an institution, uh, that has to be refinanced all the time. And uh, in some way, this, this uh, organization gains a lot of control about things then. If I, have, if, if I have just one organization valuing which information is important, you give a lot of power to that organization. With crowd mapping, that would be different. But at the same time, it would be a problem because crowd mapping means that everyone and anyone could access this app and uh, make entries, what the, any kind of entries they like to make, and you assume that people in, in in disaster areas would only enter serious information, but you see that humanita humanitarian business, uh, unfortunately, again, is a business, uh, which uh, it's, it's about billions of relief uh, funds. So I'd say that 900 organizations, including smaller and, and micro organizations, no certification at all. Uh, the uh, expertise uh, is not certified. So just a, a, a crowd only mapping would be a collection of information that would be just as chaotic as the situation was before. So I, our idea here from all these approaches, all of them have something good or have uh, uh, addressed the core of the problem with disaster communication, but uh, every time these three areas of communication are not completely covered, perhaps natural disasters uh, f in crowd mapping are not very useful because the internet will broke down, will break down, or states willingly hindering communications, or the fact that there is this central organization that has to analyze and 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 forward everything may not exist. So these three problems. We are working with Mr. Dr. Thomas Schwarzer from the uh, from a Berlin-based um, organization, university. He started something called Shark Sharknet, which went dormant uh, because, it, frankly, with Syria, we just had too much to do to continue this. Um, but we did at least come as far as developing ideas for communication in a disaster. Uh, at least in the form of mock-ups, we have something. Um, we said that if you do something like this, if you uh, start working with this, you have to have a multi-dimensional approach. Uh, you have to start by uh, registering organizations, finding which ones are there. But you have to go further and also uh, um, register the people in the organizations. Uh, so. If you say like Cardo's association is there with three medicals, they have they may have very different skills and very different areas of expertise. So it's a huge problem. Um, you have to imagine a mobile hospital uh, after an earthquake. You have uh, anesthetists and uh, someone with a bad eye injury comes along. And so how within 900 organizations and thousands of volunteers, uh, where I don't know where they camp, where they uh, their headquarters are, how can I then find a a um, expert doctor? So um, you don't just have to need to have an organization. You need to know about the individuals as well with the connected skills. Um, just as an example, what an organization like this could look like. And then the app that we would have to develop would need to give you the ability to match up the offers and the demands so that you could enable the direct communication between the different individuals and that you can request certain skills like a surgeon or a guy who evaluates the aesthetics of a building or the whole thing needs to be map based so you could uh, share the information on a wide scale so we need a, a map based distributed database that needs to work across P2P networks. And on top of the, the base map that you can just download, 
you add little extra information like this road is blocked or there's like uh, corpses you have to bury or there's a, a house that will immediately crash or in the near future. So the data is probably small enough that we can hope to get it across the peer-to-peer -peer network or the mesh networking. And we would support it by the use of Raspberry Pis so that we can uh, create data hotspots even in catastrophe areas, there's a certain social structure that manifests. But soon there is an, an open bar again, and where the, the locals meet, is, there are certain hotspots. Where is the, the airport? Where is the first shop that opens up again? Where can you take a hot shower? Those are areas where, in the near term future, a lot of a lot of the organizations and the, their members tend to meet up and it would be nice to map them out on the on the map so they can actually meet so to wrap it up the natural hotspots in disaster areas would be a great use for us uh together with the peer to peer networking and the it would still be very useful to have the app even if the networks work again so we can share it on a wider range. You could even use it um, for yourself. If from our own experience, uh, when we try to write a, a report or a f fill out a form, the, the other organization want to know from us uh, how, how many camps are there, how many survivors. Those information, uh, this information isn't collected so far and it would be really nice to save it while we're working there and we could finally end this era of paper and pen so that's all from my side thank you for listening and i'm open for questions Okay, I don't exactly know how you do this. Uh, okay, the Herald is, of course, taking over. Right. Uh, now for the Q&A. Uh, the microphone is open, but first of all, a huge thanks, not just for your talk, but also for your engagement, uh, what you do on site and, and for the infrastructure, the communications, what you do to make these things possible. Now, the game is always the same. Um, Q&A, um, and also those watching the stream, uh, please, in the room you have microphones, uh, ask, the mic ask questions to the mics. Uh, I don't actually know how you can ask questions on through the internet. I'd love to tell you. Ansonsten gibt es noch irgendwelche Sachen. Ich sehe auch drüben eben aus dem Internet, aus dem Weltnetz gibt es auch irgendwelche Fragen, die werden wir dann danach verlesen lassen. Aber erstmal zur linken Seite oder von mir linken Seite. Ich nutze die Sekunde noch. Hier vorne liegen so kleine Flyer. There are flyers that I brought, uh, which contains our contact details. If you're interested in helping, we are always happy for people contacting us. So, you are very welcome to take them. And there is a donation box as well. <laughs> okay. My name is Magdalena. Um, I live and work in Hamburg since 1968, uh, 86. Uh, and as, as an economic refugee from North Rhine-Westphalia. <laughs> My question is, Two questions. Can you can you compare the kind of area of Syria and the whole continent at war, we could say, with uh, Germany? And about your crisis management uh, worked out in Berlin, I would like to say, imagine a nuclear power station as like like Fukushima here in Europe fails and, and has a disaster 
what a scenario and, and relief program can we expect if politicians and government are not even able to uh, solve the refugee crisis we have right now. Uh, that makes me so angry and, and uh, that I can hardly believe how in a positive future anymore. I would like to continue living in Europe for 30 more years. Thank you. I'd be glad if you could answer these two questions. And thanks a lot for this great talk. I will pass on a lot from this. Well, the first question is easy to answer. Syria is, should be roughly the size of France, the, the country itself. But I wouldn't, I would just ask Google. <laughs> The, the northern border of Syria t with Turkey that basically runs up until the east border is about 800 kilometers long. That's roughly the, the measure you got to look at. But the second question I can't answer really. That kind of disaster relief is a completely different game in industrialized nations like Germany. There are helping organizations like the, the technical uh, support groups and the, the Red Cross. And, and I don't like the word crisis in this context with the, with the refugees. I actually think this is a very bad word. I don't want to answer or I don't want to speak for my organization. It's my personal opinion that I want to present. But I personally believe that there is, we can support them in, in a lot better ways than we do right now. And I have experience in that area. It was after the, the Second World War, there was a, we put into place a big uh, amount of funds and structure to take care of questions like this. Maltesians, the Red Cross, several different other organizations that are uh, working on disaster reliefs. It's, I, I think it's a scandal that refugees have to sleep out in the cold at night in Berlin. Something that we should really solve. And we actually met uh, a senator from the health administration and we asked him why we couldn't do a better job at this. And he said it, it wouldn't work if we just um, declared a state of emergency. One of the arguments is that we don't want to declare the immigrants as, as a catastrophe themselves, just the same as you would have with some flooding in Germany. Or and personally, I, I think it's wrong to say that we, we couldn't uh, take care of this with the support structure because I personally believe that the organizations we have could easily handle the situation if we just wanted to. Maybe on the topic of, a, of an actual big disaster, the technical support organization, they have a plan for this kind of thing and we actually tried to copy it or just look at the, the ansatzes that they have for dealing with this kind of thing. When you have a disaster, then you have the technical know-how and the resources of the army, of the technical support structures of the neighboring countries, and it's just a question of accessing them. Okay, I see that we have seven, seven more people at the microphones, and do we have questions from the IRC? Two more, so nine questions, 25 minutes. So you can imagine the kind of time scale. Okay. I'm wondering if you might put perhaps establish Wi-Fi access points. How much do you have to have to hide them? Can these be located by the advers adversaries and? Uh, well, there is a lot of rumors about the IIS and the Secret Service, and some of them say that they're so insanely competent that you shouldn't even pay, post something on Facebook. 
Others say, well, they're, they're on, an, on the level of like way the back 50s when. or, yeah. And if there's some, any, any area or any information about the infrastructure that we put in place is a risk. Well, we definitely we don't mark them in any special way. We, we don't want to draw attention to them. But if you supply the people there with electricity, water, whatever, anything that is a permanent installation for, for infrastructure is a target. So in situations like this, there's definitely it's, there's definitely a problem with, with having any kind of amount of infrastructure that is visible and that is permanent. So we believe that the Raspberry Pi is a really a good idea. I'm Carol from the Netherlands and I have a question. Aren't you forgetting a very large network, which is the radio amateur, amateur radio network? Oh, definitely. I cannot say anything about that. We can definitely get into contact if there is something that we're missing here. For example, um, floodings in 1953 in the Netherlands and, and Britain, the electricity and phone networks were brought down by this, and the radio amateurs uh, reported for days where the places where, where, where hospitals were, uh, where refugees could be received. Uh, you, you mustn't forget that, and uh, this is a second network. Okay, one question from the internet, IRC. Uh, the first one, um, to make these systems, this database work, uh, all the big players will have to cooperate. Is that actually realistic? Yeah, I think so. We had that question quite a bit. There is uh, two points that you can work on. Well, first, there is a, actually an actual interest from the other organizations on uh, on this topic. And the second point is that the guys that work in the field, they're actually really interested in that kind of things. The bigger organizations, that's part of my critique on them, they have a big interest in increasing the information that gets out and they usually have their they want to have their own part that they're working on where they can present themselves in the media very well so in general you probably have difficulty getting to funds but if it doesn't cost a lot and if you can just roll it out then you can easily get it working and the UNOCHJ they're definitely also interested in that and they probably wouldn't uh, bar themselves from it. Regarding the building up the infrastructure uh, quite simultaneously uh, through those net mesh networks, I was reminded of Freifunk, uh, who uh, with very low cost and a very self-organized uh, network was built. Uh, 200, 300 routers, if you have those, putting them in the field, they're not very visible. The only thing you need is electricity and uh, then have Raspberry Pis behind that or something not conspicuous, uh, th then I think uh, you have a possibility that for rather uncomplicated communications, even if one of those will be bombed, you just put the next one there, that doesn't make such a difference financially. The other point uh, was the question, uh, in, to, in what, to what extent the self-developed app was actually capable or liable to be used <laughs> Uh, had a chance to be used at large. Uh, the things that you develop, if they could be f suitable for other organizations too. Definitely during the development of the app, we want to involve other organizations. We are one of the few bigger players where we we actually believe that we could be a, a like a forerunner. We're not arrogant in, in thinking that we could get them all involved, but we, we definitely want to get them involved to get their feedback and then we probably have a mixture of the different opinions on it and Thank get you. a better solution.
A uh, small remark about catastrophe, disaster protection. I have often experienced that disasters, uh, disaster states of emergency are not, well, they don't want to call those because uh, that would put different, very different structures and organizations in place. And uh, uh, you know the, uh, you know how funding these disaster structures has been reduced over the last few years. Um, Hello. First, for that, thank you for that talk uh, and and these nice inspirations. But uh, just, uh, I'm I'm wondering if you have a distributed peer peer, peer, peer network um, in through uh, an infrastructure. To what extent do you protect the helpers and organisations from being abused uh, for as as targets for attacks for the warring parties? That's a very good question. Well, you have to look at the, the concrete uh, case where you would use it. Think about an actual natural disaster. In this case, you definitely want it to be spread. In Syria, well, that's a whole different topic. We're working on that. There's probably going to be some security protocol that prevents this kind of scenario that we're, you were discussing. And it's still an open question. I'm very interested in that topic, just as you are. That would be, I would really want to have an IT guy with me right now. Yeah, uh, the other person has already said uh, the UNHCR has case studies about, um, I don't know what the question was about, uh, Freifunk is very important, I think, uh, which is because it's half passive, you can work with that well. Semi-passive, and uh, the most used cases that you were uh, talking about were from the 50s to 70s and 80s. Uh, they had much more, much easier technology with land-based cables and such that uh, on the ground uh, could be repaired by local uh, smiths. Uh, so that will spread it. And about the data, uh, you have to encrypt the data in the app because that would otherwise give you de death lists. And uh, about the refugee crisis, the thing with the large organizations, they work on invitation. Uh, so much of the infrastructure cannot be put in place unless the state asks for it. Uh, and as far as I know, there have been requests uh, from civil society for, for them to be deployed, but they were not, they're not allowed. That was definitely a critique at the stake, or I meant it as a my my point of critique at, from for the state. We have five more questions, fifteen minutes. Okay, I'll try to be short. My question concerns not the disaster part, but the conflict part of your work. Uh, two different areas, in fact, and. Uh, it's about the protection of the civil need for security uh, from the concerns of local protest organizations, um, the way that NGOs, in the case of your NGO, or in general, protect civil society from disastrous consequences of the activities of disaster organizations. I repeat. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm always nervous, but I'll try again. And I'll explain the question later. How, do, how can the organizations protect the civil society from the consequences of Western relief organizations' activities. Uh, I'll explain that using a schematic for activism, uh, human rights, social activism. can be divided into different points. First of all, there's the actual issue, then there's the, the path and, and, and the goal. NGOs that uh, work 
with protest movements in the Arab world and supported those. They have the aim to protect the people from state repression. The strategy they follow is to establish infrastructures and, and the aim then is to support human rights and democracy. Sorry if I if I interrupt you. Just give give us the question. There are five, four or five more. No monologues, please. But please get to the question. Okay. In the case of Syria, the question is how in the future can you prevent uh, Western NGOs uh, prevent that Western NGOs make promises to local activists which are then not kept. Uh, an example before the first Syria conflict escalated, there was there was investment into communications structures through Avaz, for example, but then also there were external actors, other states that wanted to de destabilize the state. How in the future can you? Okay. I, I cannot say a lot about that. I'm definitely not very informed about this kind of thing. Thanks a lot for the question. We'll move on. Question from the internet, and then we'll go around in the room. Uh, a remark at first from Twitter. In Syria, 28.7% uh, of the area of France, uh, just to compare, and are there cases of sabotage by or against relief organizations? Yes, just like I showed before, the hospital from uh, Doctors Medicine of the Borders. And the other hospital that you saw earlier, it's definitely a problem that uh, the IS the IS targets the NGOs in order to create a state of panic and in order to get them to withdraw from the area. And it, it actually they succeeded. In Aleppo, in Aleppo, no one works there anymore. I wouldn't dare going there. And in the case of MSF, they're not even allowed to stay in Kobane for longer than a few days, and they have to probably even leave every day to go to the to the Turkish state. And this is definitely a result of this kind of attack. Dear colleague, thanks a lot for the info. Twenty-eight percent is the area of Syria. Twenty-eight percent of France. Now, about flying doctors, how can these, these, how can relief organizations move, not with a Cessna, I guess? In Syria, you mean? Yeah. Well, uh, cars have been invented. In Syria, there is no aerial traffic. Well, other than the the actual air force of Azad. So, so in other words, if they are ordered, uh, called on from wherever, they may be not be able to reach the area at all because... Uh, what, what are you saying? The relief forces, fl like flying doctors, if uh, they are asked to help, sorry that I express myself this way, if you call upon them, they then surely they cannot then reach the, the target in a certain amount of time because it's such an effort uh, by car, as you say, or lorry, uh, whether they carry supplies or not. A logistical problem. Well, definitely. If you look at the, the areas where you actually need like an emergency response vehicle or it's it's a problem getting there definitely yeah well it's an air of war okay um, back right uh, talking of pen and paper uh, we have this fantastic smartphone technology now we'd like to lose it uh, use it um, but even before then there was <coughs> 
relief activities. Now, what about the competencies and from in, and and capabilities from that time? Are they being used? And uh, the thing that you described up in, in Haiti is that uh, has all this broken down and. Uh, could they perhaps be connected using this conventional way? Well, you have to see that the, the actual landscape of disaster relief has changed a lot over the last decades. There have been a lot of new NGOs that were created during the 80s. There were a few big NGOs in the past, and there was a lot of critique on the way they worked. And then there is there were a lot of new NGOs that were created, and you, you see that there's, I mean, the, the, the sheer number of the 900 NGOs that were working in Haiti is, is mind-boggling. And the, the chaos actually came from the sheer number of the NGOs that were there. Thank you. Now, let's go to the question from the internet and any other questions you can ask later. Surely you'll be here in the room for a while. Dear internet. Okay, two more questions. Uh, have you talked, uh, assessed the scalability of all these people are uh, in radio networks? Indeed, there's a debate about who do you actually want to enable in this way? Who do you want to get into contact with? And I'm I'm very critical of these kind of one-man NGOs that just go into the disaster areas with a suitcase full of uh, s pharmaceuticals are it's definitely not very interesting to get those hooked up but if there are individuals with that are very highly skilled then they will not just uh, end up there and if if you have someone like a, a surgeon or um like an engineer they definitely don't just uh, quit their job and travel there there will always be people that you won't reach with this kind of network, of course. And the second question, uh, as uh, continuing from earlier, there, there has been sabotage, has there been sabotage between relief organizations? I wouldn't call it sabotage. There are scenes that are definitely not very constructive and in Haiti there was kind of a gold rush uh, they actually staked their own claims and we we were kind of helpless watching how the organizations were uh, fighting on the organizational level and there was definitely not a very constructive uh, way of working together and the organizations in the humanitarian uh, sector definitely live on uh, donations, so they're fighting over that resource. I wouldn't call it sabotage, but... I have a question about the mobile hospital. It happens during the wartime that uh, friendly military units actually hit their own hospitals. How good is the communication between the military and the hospitals here? How do you ensure that you don't hit them? Well, a certain risk, risk remains. Uh, the, the, you know the case of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and, and the military in, in France, uh, the French, French military. Surely it was communicated where this hospital was. And it is the case that in the North Syrian areas there was a good communication because people know each other and have been working with each other for a long time. So the local militia uh, can be told where we are and, and where we do not like to be shelled. Uh, but in, in North Syria, it's not the case. You imagine that there's fighting everywhere and anywhere. The, the area that I showed earlier is completely pacified from, from fighting and, and the, the places where there are borders between the areas, that's where the fighting is. So if you're not as crazy as, as putting up a mobile hospital in those areas, but there, but where the civil societies, they don't normally hang around in the frontier areas, uh, that's, uh, ha then you have uh, uh, individual attacks, uh, terrorist attacks as the main problem or 
whatever you want to call them. So the making it much harder to plan attacks. Okay. So last but not least, last but not least, uh, thanks for your efforts to. Uh, there's a lot of courage, I guess, required to do things like that. And uh, you can hear him from Austria, and uh, I come from, from this area where many, many refugees cross borders now. And the question I'm asking myself is, uh, with a lot of relief uh, organizations or people how are you? How is your? How your? How your? How do your shifts change? Um, how can you find some time to relax? Sometimes I cannot give you a definite answer on this. This is very dependent on the organization you're working in. I know the doctors about borders. They usually during their shifts in the area they usually have three months that they have to plan for every organization of course has their own safety protocol with this but since we're completely a volunteer organization we cannot really have a lot of say in this we just we usually try not to stay longer than two or three weeks in the area of crisis but during the refugee crisis, and I don't want to call it, but you can plan it in a whole different level. And going back to normality is really easy. You just go to some shelter and you're out there. In in a disaster area, it's not possible. And it's definitely very up to the organization. So the refugee question. There was they, they relied a lot on volunteers. There are people who have been working in this uh, area on the, around the border that have been working for months at a time. Well, thanks a lot to you anyway. Okay, now last question from the left, just in time. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. The whole relief business is, of course, a bit community-driven, at least if you consider donate donations. Now, to the technical aspect of, of your solutions, uh, I was missing the term open source community. Are you active in that field as well to find technically skilled people from the open source community? Definitely. I don't know the term, but if I understand you correctly, we definitely do. We try to recruit different people from basically anywhere, and it's a very colorful mixture that we have, and yeah, definitely. Okay, great. That finishes the first talk of the day in room six, and also our translation. Um, I hope you've been able to follow this. Applause to Sebastian Judemann, and perhaps also applause to Sebastian, the translator, the other translator.